if those opinion those opinions of the host and guest guest plural tonight are those of the host and guest and do not represent any sponsors, affiliates, or anybody else. My first guest tonight, I'm excited to have him back on. Is George Norrie from Coast to Coast AM, best selling author. I don't want to get too far into the bio. If, if they don't know who you are by now, they probably are never gonna know how you're doing. How are you doing tonight, George? Jimmy, I'm great. Looking forward to being on your program, The Mallard Report. I've heard so many good things about it. You finally corralled me and got me on. <laughs> yeah, you're like nailing Jola to the wall, but I keep after it, and that's what you tell me to do, and that's what I tell people to do about coming on my show. you got to keep after me. And finally, this so, squeak, the squeaky squeaky wheel gets the oil. I'm looking forward to it. Let's go for it. So I, I wanted to ask you a couple media questions because we've talked about paranormal and radio in the past but there's some things in the media right now or radio more specifically that have caught my eye i want your opinion on them okay like, like michael savage going to podcasting now how do you feel about that because that's is that a blow to you or is that is that a good sign that radio is still the thing well, you know, we podcast coast to coast as well. Uh, we edit it down and make a condensed version of the show. It's just another source. It's another way for people to be able to listen to programs they like. And, um, you know, we're on 680 terrestrial radio stations. Radio's been very strong for our show and is strong for our company. But podcasting is a growing industry as well. And so I think... Savage was probably smart to be able to, you know, divert a little bit of his show into a podcast, as you are. So now the next, well, the question that comes up after that, obviously in your company there is Rush, and that, that his health situation is de deteriorating fast. I mean, that's going to leave a major hole in the middle of the lineup. Would I, I'm going to ask this question. Obviously, I know the answer, but I'm going to ask you this anyways. Would you take that time slot? No, I'm a nighttime guy, Jim. It's my program, and right now it's rushes as long as he can handle it and take it. I, I knew the answer was no, I, but I often joke that, that that's more my time slot. Like I like doing a little more variety of bit of stuff, but I'm not at nearly as protocol as rushes, so I don't think Premier would even entertain that thought. But it's just a fun joke that I like to say because I don't know if I could do your your slot that. But I'm, I'm on the East Coast too, so I think that factors. I know you're in the Midwest right now, but you also do the show from L.A., so that probably helps a great deal And doing it yeah, for all these years. It's a little break in terms of the time, but, you know, right now, L.A., with COVID and everything, is virtually on a lockdown. Uh, they don't even allow live music in a little place afterwards. Uh, it's, it's crazy. Things are out of control. So I'm back in the Midwest where things have somewhat of a lifestyle, and I'm, you know, enjoying my, my stay. So about that, though, I mean, I know you used to do live events. Do you miss going to places and meeting people? Yeah, we've had lots of live events uh, canceled, Jim. I, I love the one-on-one -on -one with folks. I love being on stage. I love the interaction with a live audience. I miss that. I miss that a lot. I was supposed to be in Chicago this coming weekend at a Health Freedom Expo. We're going to do it by Zoom my portion, first time I've ever done Zoom before. They've got like six, 700 people who've signed up for it, and it's growing every day. But uh, you lose the excitement of being there live. It's just not the same. Yeah, I'm sitting here thinking, doing my show, that's virtually the same thing. You, you know there's people out there listening, but I mean, I guess you might get to see some of their faces, but it's still not the same as being there. And then getting to, uh, this is probably a bad phrase, work the room afterwards, but that's what it is. Yeah, Zoom is almost like radio, where you, you know, do your thing and get a little response from people afterwards, but you definitely lose that personal feeling, that personal touch with folks. So you met, we've mentioned the COVID thing. How, how is, has that changed Coast at all, like the day-to-day -day operations of Coast, or has, has that remained the same throughout this process? Well, a lot of people are working from home or wherever they were working before. Uh, but it, it's been an effect on every business, every person, and it's going to have an effect on people after the fact. If and when things get back to what we used to call normal, I think people are used to working out of their homes, working out of wherever they were working before, and companies are going to take a look at their lease arrangements with the buildings they're in and go, well, gosh, we don't need this kind of space. We can get... 50% of our employees to do exactly what they were doing and working out of their own house. Let's cut this. It's going to have an impact on everybody. 
Yeah, I, I was talking to my wife about that the other day. I said, we're, you know, everybody's worried about all these businesses closing. And I said, yeah, that's that's a problem. But the other problem is going to be the uh, office space is going to just be vacant, too. Because, like you were saying, if everybody can work from home or a majority and have a smaller actual physical... I mean, there's tons of space that's going to be available in a bri- variety of markets, let alone... I know here in Pennsylvania they did a uh, eviction freeze, so you couldn't free, you know, couldn't evict anybody. And eventually, that's going to come due, and that's going to be just a sloppy mess when all these evictions come up. Absolutely, I would not like to be in commercial real estate right now, Jimmy. Not <laughs> in the least. So, what, what, what's the, what's the next few years hold for George Nori? You, you're, st- I, I mean, I, I, I always tell people when they ask me. About you, you said on this program that uh, they'd be basically pulling the mic out of your cool dead hands. Is that still where we're at with um, your future? No, no plans of slowing down. No, ab- absolutely. I mean, we're into our 18th year, and I'm just going to keep going, God willing, as long as I can. Uh, the network and I are talking about extending the contract well into 20s, into the 2020s, deep into the 2020s, a decade. And uh, I'm just going to keep going. You know, if the voice can stay young, you could be 120. Who cares, right? It's radio. <laughs> yeah, I mean, as long as the mind's sharp and the voice is there, I think, I mean, you can do it. Exactly. Who am I talking to? Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's okay. I've, uh, people ask me that all the time. It's okay. It's not nothing new. And more importantly, people ask, why am I talking to you? But that's a whole other can of worms. Um, okay. Now, I've, I've seen this one come up. You know, but this is nothing new for you and me. We've talked about this before. The coast isn't the same it used to be even a couple years ago. Is uh, There's a tension behind this, right? You guys aren't just throwing mud at the, the wall. You guys do have a vision for where you where it is today and where you, you, it needs to be going forward. You're just not slapping guests back to back to back. I, I did one thing when I came in, Jim, and I changed the format and went to two guests a night instead of one. The reason for that is, is research was showing that if you got turned off by the first guest, you were gone. At least now we've got a better opportunity, the chance to keep that listener tuned in with two different people, two different types of stories, whether it's a harder news story and a paranormal one or something like that. And it's working for us. You know, when I took over, we were at 433 affiliates. And uh, we are now up to 680. That's absolutely unheard of for commercial radio these days. So something's working. Um, Something has also changed. This planet is different. It's changed. People, just by COVID, look look what's happened to people. And you can't do paranormal 24-7 anymore. Those days are gone. It's unfortunate. They were fun. We always have it. It's the staple of the show. Uh, you will notice that the second half of every night is somewhat unusual and strange, but you can't do it 24-7. The, the times have changed. I, I'll, I think also the influx of shows like mine has changed that, too, because there's so much more paranormal content. Well, there's so much more content, comma, paranormal content out in the universe that back when Art was doing it in the early, the early days, there was his sto- that, that show doing it and greater it was an de- back in those days it, yeah. you know it was it was unique it's different now there's uh programs as you just said all over the place dealing with different facets you know we've got some people who concentrate on ghosts we have some people who concentrate on uh you know bigfoot and sasquatch and uh, others just do ufo shows uh you know there's a variety out there and you know we need to keep things mixed up and what we have is a very loyal, growing, strong audience. Um, we are the programs offered for free to radio stations, so we are advertiser driven, and that continues to grow too, even in an economic climate that is so so for a lot of industry. Yeah, I was going to say it, it's it's impressive to watch the growth year after year, and every time I get the opportunity to talk to you to hear what is going on and how it's um, evolving. Which, I mean. I, I, I was telling one of my listeners the other day about the local morning show here, and they do it as an internet broadcast and as a it goes out to the AM stations, and they don't sync up. 
Like it's it's awful to listen to. I'm, I'm sure it's great when you watch it on the, the internet, but it's like, well, just sync the, the the commercials up and do a good product. But it doesn't. I don't know. That's a, that's a little rant. You don't have to comment on that because I don't want to get you in trouble with people. But uh, just do a little more work. Anyways, so I got. I guess I should promo this while I've got you here, and I'll, I'll ask you uh, next week. I do my annual prediction show for 2021. So you know, I know you probably do yours late in December. I I get it out of the way early. What do you th- What do you think of 2021 holds? I think COVID is going to carry over into 2021. Things are going to be much the same. Um, You know, we're going to have an interesting presidential election in a week. Uh, That's going to, uh, I think, affect how things happen in 2021 as well. Uh, I do think China has its eyes on Taiwan. God knows what's going to happen there and what we're going to do, because we do have a treaty to defend that country. So we'll have to see what happens. It's going to be an intriguing year. Uh, we do our uh, prediction programs on December 31st and January 1st. So we do two of them back-to-back with different guests, astrologers, psychics, and people like that. But 2021 is uh, going to be, a, unfortunately, a little bit of the same as 2020 going into it. And uh, we'll see what happens toward the middle part to the end of the year and hope things get better for people. All I know is this year, Jimmy, on New Year's Eve, when people are together holding hands, dancing, or doing whatever they do, and they always say, God, I'm glad this year is gone, they all mean it this time. <laughs> yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Like you know, But I, I'm fully aware that we flip the calendar does not mean that the world actually changes, but it's going to feel good to at least get this 2020 off the book so yeah, to speak but, so let's get it behind us and move forward and uh get people united again and get uh get people happy that's the important thing you know you've got a great audience we've got a great audience you know people are people and you know they they just want to one have a happy life enjoy their families and you know and, and, and move on with it uh i used to get bothered a lot in the early days of uh, coast to coast when I'd get any kind of criticism, and I had to grow into that. And you realize, you know, these are just people with their own little views. Some are haters. You know what I'm talking about. (laughs) There are plenty uh, of them. But you know what? Life moves on, so let's just do it. I'd still buy them a beer if I was in a bar with them. Yeah, and I think most of them would probably come up to you, or, you know, however that would go, and they'd have an adult conversation and be legitimate and probably on the... uh, the happier side of things. I don't think too many people. I mean, it's easy. It's easy to say things on the internet. I guess is where I'm headed. I have never ever had a person come up to me in person and be rude. Now they may have been haters on the internet, but in terms of in person, they've always been friendly, delightful, and very courteous. We need to get these live events back so I can change that. No. <laughs> You have been a, been a supporter of mine for years. What are you saying? All right, well, I just just so we could film that that moment of me walking up to you and saying something horrible and put it on you. Do anything for publicity, <laughs> you rat. Well, that's the name of the game, right? No, I, I'm just eh, sometimes. <laughs> uh, no, I don't think so. I don't think uh, there's good publicity and bad publicity, and then there's publicity you just don't want. That's exactly right. Uh, talk about publicity that idiot on CNN, which I'm not even going to talk about. <laughs> that's the kind of publicity you don't want. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I, that's not the... Um, no, that's just that's insanity to me. But, anyways. Oh, so I, I've got a, a, a listener question here for you, and it comes from Cat Word of Paranormal Heart. She does one of these great paranormal podcasts that we were talking about. I had to give her some credit for this. Prior to receiving the book given to him by your mother... At the age of thirteen, we are not alone. By Walter Sullivan, has young George did, did young George have any paranormal experiences for himself? No, the only thing that I had, if you want to call it paranormal, was that eleven-year-old time where I had an out-of-body projection, and that is what it was a catalyst for me to really get into this. Uh, I woke up in the morning. I was uh, bouncing on the ceiling, looking down at my body which immediately then rammed myself into my physical body. I woke up and went, what is that? I thought it was a dream. Went to the library, found a book on astral projection, stumbled into that section, 
And sure enough, there was a picture of an astral body floating above the physical body in bed. And I said, that's exactly what happened to me. And I was obsessed with it ever since. That's just remarkable to think about that, A, you were that present and then able to find said stuff to help you. Absolutely. And the name of the book was Projection of the Astral Body by Hayward Carrington and Sylvan Muldoon. A great book. Oh, George, actually, Whitley's calling in right now. Do you want to say hello to him yourself, or should I just push you Yeah, whatever you want to do. Just introduce, you you know, just tell him I'm on the line so he's not shocked. Yeah, I will. (laughs) Whitley, welcome to the Mauer Report. How are you doing this evening? Hi, it's Whitley Strieber. How are you doing? I've got George Norrie on the line, actually, just finishing up a little bit. Do you want to, just so you know, I actually got one more question for him, and then I'll be off to you, okay? Okay, shall I... Call back or just hold? Just, just hold for just a few seconds. George, okay, sure. Uh, George, as as we're going through this, Whitley's here, and I, I'm talking to him about his new book, and I know you talked to him about that a couple of days ago. Um, experiencers, how, how are we defining them now? Are they still... Because I, I know there's a lot of hoaxes out there. I guess I'm not wanting to put him in that category. But it's harder because everybody has a story. Do you follow what I'm saying? Is it hard for you guys to sort out the mud on coast? Well, no, not at all. Uh, You know, Whitley has been uh, probably one of the best guests we've had in this genre and uh, just about any kind of topic, and he's the real deal. Now, I'm I'm just talking in general. I didn't mean to refer to him. I'm just saying... No, 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 no. I know that, but I'm using that as an example. Okay. We've... We vet people by interviewing them extensively, and, you know, it's our job to try to find the best we can for our audience. Is it really happening to them? We don't know, and we'll never know. But I believe people like Travis Walton and Whitley Strieber and people like that, that these events have happened to. Um, the Socorro, New Mexico event a long time ago with the police officer, Lonnie Zamora. Something happened to him. So those are the kinds of guests we go after, and you know, and hopefully uh, the audience appreciates that. Well, George, I appreciate you immensely, and uh, thanks for taking the time, and we'll keep talking. Continue success, Jim. You're one of, a good, one of the good guys. Thank you, sir. Have a, have a good afternoon. Have a, who, wait, before you go, who's on your show tonight? Well, tonight we're going to have to have Lynn McTaggart on for the last two hours talking about intention experiments and her thoughts on COVID. In the first two hours, my colleague Ian Punnett has written a book about millennials, and he's on. So we're going to be doing it in a few hours. Well, thank you, sir, and have a good show tonight. Okay, and uh, best to Whitley. Whitley, thank you for joining me tonight, and thank you for allowing me to do that last little bit there. That's um, Oh, Sure. <laughs> Um, when he said he had time available, I just said, sure. And then I looked at my calendar and went, oh, no, I was already booked a little bit. So thank you for, A, delaying, <laughs> and thank you for uh, being gracious there. Um, you're here tonight to talk about A New World, uh, your latest book. Um, yes. Uh, give me the br- – I have it in my hands, and I've only partway through, so don't spoil the end for me, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but go ahead and, go ahead and give the uh, the listeners out there who have not heard or seen anything about this a little bit about it. All right, well, in a long time ago now, back in 1985, I had a very bizarre experience in the middle of the night on December the 26th. And I basically woke up in a room full of very strange-looking creatures who had me... Un- I could not... I was not mobile. I, I was trapped some- in some way that I didn't understand. And, of course, I thought it was a nightmare... And I kept trying to wake up. And finally, I had to face the fact that I, in fact, I was awake. And uh, I became upset. And then this suddenly this voice turned on that said in a very mild sort of female voice, what can we do, kept repeating, what can we do to help you stop screaming? And the answer was, not a lot. (laughs) <laughs> unbelievably scary i mean it was just and and i was i was raped and 
not intentionally they were they were doing their thing and i was fighting like a a demon to get out of there and uh they hurt they injured me in the fracas that resulted and uh then i had they put me returned me to my to my bed apparently i don't remember that part of it and i woke up the next morning obviously very strung out and unsure about what had happened i thought that there had been some kind of a i i thought there had been some kind of a disturbance in the house i thought there'd been an owl i decided that there must have been an owl in the house because these things have these big eyes and my mind was just not really willing to let me accept my memories and so i said that to my wife and she was sort of perplexed because you know we it's the middle of the winter we're out in the country all the doors and windows are closed up tight there's no chimney i mean there was a chimney to it, but it was for a wood stove so nothing could have come down that chimney and and lived because the stove was 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 burning so um i was just at a loss i couldn't think figure it out and why i would have these memories and finally i became became aware of the fact with, over the next couple of days i was really sore i hurt I was beat up. I had a red mark on the side of my head, and my uh, down below was injured. And so I went to the doctor, and, and he was pretty frank about it. He said, after examining, he said, you know, you understand you've been raped. I said, I don't know how that could be, because I still didn't remember any of the things that happened. He said, well, something did this to you. You've been you've had a violent encounter of some sort and i just was left his office in a state of complete freak out i didn't know what to think and um i began to try to f f i thought it was a criminal act I, you know it didn't occur to me anything about aliens i never th thought of such a thing I might have been interested in flying saucers when I was a kid in the 50s, but we all were. I mean, I certainly hadn't thought of that in a long time. So uh couldn't figure out what why, what motive would there be. I, you know, I was a writer. I'd written a controversial book called War Day that had been... Uh, uh, Senator Kennedy had read parts of it out on the floor of the Senate, and he was so impressed by it. And I thought to myself, maybe some people who don't like Kennedy, you know, I just couldn't, but that just didn't seem real to me. Who would do it? Who would care that much? Who would find some writer out in the woods? I mean, it just didn't strike me as possible. Also, we had an alarm system. So, as it happened, my brother, who has a little bit more, yeah, he's, has a, he was more interested in this kind of stuff than I was, sent me a book for Christmas about UFOs and you know I looked at it and just oh god another one of these moronic gifts and you know thank you very much it's so interesting I'm glad I have it and I plan to never read it but then I thought to myself wait a minute that was a little room full of weird things that they could they have been aliens is that what that's about so I read the book and that's where it all started, it, the book had a mention of a, of a UFO investigator called Bud Hopkins in it, who specialized in abductions. And uh, I finally decided about after, in March, I guess, this it happened in December, I had been, uh, that had happened to me. That had happened to me. Now, 30 years later, I'm still involved with the visitors. I started going out in the woods at night, as scary as that was, because I just couldn't let it go. I mean, my God, people from another world, I'm not going to just sit and, you know, sit there and, and mope about it. I wanted to figure out how, how can I somehow continue this relationship because this is absolutely incredible. And, you know, I, I was scared to death. I, I'm not, I won't lie to you. I, it was almost the first night I went out there, it was almost impossible to put one foot in front of another. It was like, I think it must have been, like what, what would have been to ascend a gallows or something. But I did it anyway, and I kept doing it. And after 
In a few months, they started to return. And the cabin became a, like a... We had many people that come, came there and had experiences with them. It was absolutely amazing. I mean, they, they turned out to be really, really interesting creatures, whatever they are. I still don't know if they're aliens or not. I have no idea where they're from or exactly. But uh, then I, my wife passed away. Well, I, let me back up. Sometime in the mid-90s, we, we would get thousands of letters about this. This is before email. And she came out of her office one afternoon, and she said, Whitley, this has something to do with what we call death. And I said, what do you mean? She said, well, look at what happens at the cabin. And look at what all these letters are saying. And what, what she was referring to is that whenever the visitors, as I call them, were around, people's dead friends and relatives would also sort of be involved, like Laurie Barnes, one of the witnesses at the cabin, was walking, taking a walk one afternoon, and there standing in the road is her brother, who's been missing for 20 years and declared dead by the FBI. And he, she says, my God, what are you doing here? And she, he says, I just wanted to let you know I'm all right. And she says, but come down to the house and meet my friends. And he smiled at her and just sort of drifted off into the woods beside the road and uh, uh, was gone. She came back to their house shaking like a leaf. And Annie and I knew then the visitors would show up that night. We said that to no one, but they did. They so showed up and they, they uh, she and uh, another lady named Raven Dana and a third lady all had an encounter. Oh, and two filmmakers, uh, uh, husband and wife, who were in the, in the house also had an encounter with the same entity that night. And that's how it went. And now, fast forward to 2015, my wife passes away. And we are <coughs> incredible. You still there? Whitley, are you there? Well, that's a weird cut. It says he's still connected. That is an interesting one. That is weird. It says he's still connected. I guess I should... Yeah, let's do that. Yeah, so I uh, just hung up on him because I wanted him to ring me back here. Maybe I can... Let's see. Yeah, it was weird. That is still weird because it was still connected and the call just, like, dropped off the face of the earth. And, um... I'm trying to figure out how, because I had the calls jo joined together there, how to get them back apart. Ooh, Skype. That's always fun. Okay. By the time I get this all figured out, type then, he'll probably call me back. Good radio here as I type. Okay, I think I got that. Hello? Welcome back. You you were just saying that your wife had passed and the call just dropped off the face of the planet. <laughs> I thought you hung up on me. <laughs> no, I did it. I would not do that to well, you. <laughs> you, know, you can expect that with, with me. You try, I have a podcast. Try running a podcast with all this craziness in your life. <laughs> Uh, but let's let's keep on. Uh, I, uh, anyway, she passes on, and that, later that night, the friend calls, and I'm and and proceeds to say the strangest thing just happened. I just heard Anne's voice in my ear telling me to call you, and I thought that's odd. I, I, and I said, "Well, honey, Anne passed away at, earlier this evening at seven fifteen, and." This kept happening with other friends. I mean, people, you know, the next, by the next day, they all knew she had died, but they didn't. She, this lady had not known that that night, I don't think. 
And uh, but it kept happening. And then I realized and remembered that back when we had realized that this supposed alien abduction thing was also very connected with the appearance of the dead and so forth, uh, we made a pact, Anna and I did, that we would tell nobody, but that the one who died first would try to connect with the other one, not directly, but by connecting through friends. And Anne did it. And it was extraordinary. And she, you know, we're we're like still married. I mean, it, it, we wrote a book together after she died called "The Afterlife Revolution," and it was it turned out to be an amazing, beautiful thing to be connected with the visitors because it's made my life much bigger, and it's made my grief and my experience of my wife's passing a much different thing than it normally was is you know they're a hard bunch i mean they're not easy to deal with but they have got immense understanding of the nature of the world and if you get involved with them you begin to learn from them and that's what the book a new world is all about what i have learned since 2015 when they came roaring back into my life after Annie passed away. And so did Annie in another way. It's a it's a marvelous life, I have to tell you. I never would have thought it would have been like this, but it is. And for everybody out there who doesn't know, it's available today. It actually, it released today, is that correct? Uh, a New World is available, yeah, absolutely. Uh, is... You can get in hardcover, softcover, and other methods i think too yeah. audible kindle all of it so I, i've got to ask this question and i have back 30 years ago after this first incident happened and you started going to the woods i'm i'm sure because this is how this goes in my house you had a discussion with your wife how did that that first discussion go saying that you were going to go back and try to have this communication she was always for it she never thought of them as being something evil at all. It was absolutely, she, Anne is the one who directed the whole experience. When I was writing the book Communion, Anne was the one who edited, who, who formed it, who made it what it became. And um, I was going to call it body terror, because it was like the ultimate t terror that I had experienced. And she said, no, 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 that's not what it's about, Whitley. This is about contact with them. It's about com more than contact. It's about communion. And that's why we called it communion, because it's about this deep sharing of souls. And uh, uh, that is what it's about, by the way. And it's how I live. I'm, I share myself with this presence. I don't call them the visitors anymore. I just think of it as a presence. And... Um, so that's, she was, no, she wasn't concerned. When I said I was going to go out in the woods, her main concern was that I had the guts to actually do it. And she would say, so are you going to start tonight? And I would say, well, listen, it's not you going out there. And she said, Whitley, go out and see what happens. See what happens. I said, what if you never see me again? What if I go out there and just disappear? She said, nope, that's not going to happen. She knew. My wife was a magical person, and she was a brilliant, just an extraordinary woman, and totally capable of doing this. She, it was like she was trained for it. Was she, was she into this type, of, even the like ghosts or anything before this experience to you? Or was Not this at a, all. Neither one of us were. Not at all. I mean, I'd written some horror novels, and so, yeah, we knew about vampires and ghosts, but... Yeah, well, there's a Not difference between real. writing about them and living with them, I guess is the easy way to put it. Uh, yeah, <laughs> there's a great deal of difference between writing fiction about vampires and werewolves and things and waking up in the middle of the night and you're in a room full of goblins. <laughs> it's real. <laughs> that's, a, that's a big leap there. 
Actually, that was one of the questions I had, or one of the notes I wanted to ask you about the different the the difference it takes from going from nonfiction to fiction, and the amount of work and how that all comes together for you. Because I know I've talked to some writers who just do one or the other, and a few only a few only bounce back and forth. So give me some insight into that because I know you do you do it and do it well. Oh, thank you. I well, I I do both and I enjoy both. I've just finished a book. Uh, uh, which is a new vision of Jesus, which is total. It's nonfiction from beginning to end, and um, I, you know, I like to write fiction. I, it exercises my imagination, and I enjoy it. And I'm probably going to write another book of fiction soon. Uh, but the process is very different. Fiction versus nonfiction is a, they're very different. Uh, f- nonfiction is intellectually rigorous. Fiction is introspectively rigorous. You have to look inside yourself for the characters. You have to find them. And you have to surrender to them and let them become alive and take over take over your life uh, when you're writing them. You have to belong to them. You are their instrument and their tool to express their experiences out in the world. They have to feel very real to you. And, you know, a writer who does it that way, whose characters feel real to him or to her, and one who doesn't, you can tell it instantly in the first two sentences of any book they write. Um, you can't construct, you, you have to construct nonfiction. Fiction you can't construct. It creates itself or it never comes to life. Yeah, because, it, it, you know, I I do tend to stay with the nonfiction stuff, but the, the fiction stuff always draws me. Now, I I guess I'm not that creative and able to get that far down the path, so I do appreciate immensely when you're able to just let it go and get it done. So, Yeah. So, how, so I've got characters banging around in my head right now who want a book, <laughs> so I might write another book of fiction very soon. I was going to say, so you obviously just got this book that came out today. You said you're, you've got the next one done. Is that what I just heard? Yeah, I've, I've finished the manuscript. It's not well. Yeah, going to be published. So you're you're probably starting on how many book ideas do you have like in an index card system or wherever you just throw ideas at? It's all in my head. Oh, so how how my many index card system <laughs> is in my head? In my head right now, I have a film script that the friend or producer wants me to write very badly and that I'm probably going to write. I have a novel, two novels, uh, and a possible another nonfiction book that is forming somehow. I'm not quite sure what it's about yet. That's what's rolling around in there right now. That's a, that's in, in cra- that's just crazy to think about all that stuff going on in there, plus the day-to-day life, um, how things have to be. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's the truth. It, you know, it's. Um, um, so, I love doing it. I'm. I was made to do this. This is my my vocation. Well, I, that's where I was going to ask next. Do you do you sit down and write for a, f- a fixed amount of time, or you just go after it whenever the mood hits you? Uh. My writing doesn't belong to me. I belong to my writing. And my writing, if my writing wants me, I'm perfectly capable of doing a 24-hour shift. Um, and uh, uh, I I work endlessly. Endless. I never stop. I love it. I love the struggle and the, you know, you know the worst thing in the world is a blank page. And also the best. Because you can fill it with anything, and you might just fill it with something wonderful, and you never not can be sure. So I work all the time. I love to work. Well, obviously. And also, <laughs> you know, I have my podcast. I have my website. Yeah, well, as I said, give, give me some of that stuff, because we've got to get it out there. The people who well, are... Uh, well, the podcast is called Dreamland, and you can get it on um, Apple Podcasts, on all kinds of places. It, it, gosh... Uh, it's on Alexa. It's uh, it's on TuneIn Radio. It's it's just all over the place, basically. Uh, 
And you all can also get it on my website, unknowncountry.com. And it comes in two versions, a free version, which is an hour long and has commercials, and a subscriber version, which is an hour and a half long and has no commercials. The website's got a huge archive of stories and all kinds of interviews and everything dating back to 2004. And it's got a big social media component with uh, weekly chats with me on Wednesday evenings and um, video meetings and uh, a free message board and all kinds of stuff. It's a, it's a very, very active site. Well, it keeps you active for sure. I mean, did I say its name? It's called unknowncountry.com. I'm not sure. <laughs> I think you did, but as the uh -oh. joke as the joke goes, it's better to say it twice than not say it at all. <laughs> right. So I want I want to go back through this. The, I mean, it was these they've been with you for thirty years now, and it, it recently picked up again. Was there ever yeah. a was there ever a time that you thought it was over? Yeah, many times. You know, they come and go on their own schedule i can't predict it um I, I i will say this though i have found one thing that when i'm at conferences and if there's somebody staying in the room with me the visitors are almost always going to show up because they don't they're not flying around in flying saucers they come out of the air i mean they their their methods of whatever they are they are they are completely they have a completely different relationship to reality than we do. And even a few seconds with them to somebody who hasn't been with them a lot is extremely hard. My co-author for my book before last, uh, Supernatural, Jeff Kripal, who is the, I believe he's the, uh, he's in the, he's a professor of religious studies at Rice University and a good friend, was with me at Esalen a couple of years ago, which is this, beautiful uh, sort of retreat on uh, in Big Sur in Northern California overlooking the Pacific and um, he was he wanted to stay in the room with me and I said Jeff yeah, they're going to be here because this room is so perfect it, the room it's first it was an isolated place and the room had a little deck and then there was a cliff overlooking the, the Pacific Ocean an ideal place for them and they, they always like isolated places although they come to this apartment all the time they're used to that but if you're if you'd like I go to a city a big hotel in a city if I don't stay for three or four days I'm not gonna see them but at Esalen no question I would see them and so they show up in the room and this is only one of them it's a very brief meeting because there's something about the way they are that's different from the way we are that's real hard for us. They are outside of time looking in is the best way to describe it, I believe. We are inside time, and when they, the river of time, if you get near them, you're, you're pulled out of the river of time. It's like being the confusion, the total confusion of a fish being suddenly pulled out of the water, something that seemingly couldn't happen. So one of them comes in and they wants to meditate with me, meaning it would wake me up by touching me, on the, usually on the hand or blowing in my face or something. And then I'll go sit and I'll meditate. And usually I don't see him. Sometimes I see him when I'm meditating, not often. But it also woke Jeff up. And he said he, said he heard this crashing sound, like the whole world was crashing down around him. And then he said, I heard my own voice somewhere inside me cry out, Oh my God! And it's because there's a total implosion of your reality when they get near you, unless they are very, very cloaked, very, very suppressed, I would say. But they don't need to be that way around me because I'm used to it. So he was deeply shaken, and, and, and that that happens um, Annie only saw them once or twice and she wasn't comfortable with being with them physically although she knew so much more about them than I did 
she still couldn't handle it. Interestingly enough, our cats were unbelievably terrified by them. They were, all, they were almost rendered unconscious with fear when the visitors came into the cabin, when they were there. I was afraid they'd have heart attacks. Well, I could see why. I mean, that's not an everyday yeah. occurrence for us, let alone them. And then, you know, when a cat gets scared, his tail puffs up. Yep. It turns out that there's another level of fear in a cat. The entire cat can puff up. <laughs> You've never seen anything like it. They look like giant caterpillars. <laughs> I was just picturing that in my head. That's just... Uh, yeah, yeah. It's funny. It was funny. And they'd, they'd like, crawl along the back of the couch going, row, row. <laughs> and you think to yourself, well, like, if the cats are so scared, am I some kind of fool? <laughs> yeah, well, I think we've established that, right? <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, you have to be a fool to go out there and do this, because in the end, I said, used to say to Annie, what if in the end I am just eaten? And she said, well, you had a good ride. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Man. But, you know, they never hurt anybody in my family, in the cabin, children, adults. They came around all the time when the child, when we, when my, our son had friends there, and and we told all the parents, we said, listen, this is real. This is happening. And not one parent ever wanted their ch child not to come there, not even when the children would come home and say what, tell things of stories of what happened to them. And some of it is, is eerie and creepy. I wouldn't say it. It's some of Well, I will say that. Some of it's ominous. There's some elements of danger in here that are not understood and that are pretty scary. Yeah, I was going to say, I put myself in, I was thinking about your cats, and then you mentioned children. I'm thinking, as a, what is it, 36-year-old man, I'm not sure I'm ready for any of this. No, no, nobody's ever ready for it. That's one of the problems they have. It, it, you know, they're not going to sit down, and, you know, a lot of the military people do not like them at all. They don't like me either, because I'm able to handle this, and they, I guess they, they resent it a little bit and fear it. Uh, so, but, uh, and there's been trouble. There's plenty of trouble. A guy right, a researcher called Frank Ficino, some years ago, wrote a very good book about the sort of underside of this called Shoot Him Down. And uh, it was basically about all the violent exchanges between them and the military that have taken place taken place up until up in the 50, uh, through the 50s and 60s and um, you know it turned out that one of my uncles was involved in the Roswell incident and he introduced me to his commanding officer General F. Exxon, Arthur Exxon who was later, he was retired when I met him but he was had been common, commanding at uh, uh, Wright Pat Air Force Base and when it was right field and they were both young officers um, the debris from Roswell was brought there because they, they and they were in the air materiel command which analyzed uh, you know basically foreign aircraft and weapons and things like that so it fell to them they were among the officers who analyzed this tried to analyze this material and um after our published communion, my uncle called me, and I was living in New York, and he was down in San Antonio, Texas, and he said, Whitley, you need to come down. I want to talk to you about your book. And all we knew about his career was that it had been top secret the whole career, his whole career. We never knew a thing about what he did. And he proceeds to tell me the story of the Roswell incident, which I had actually not heard of until I... No, I think I had heard of it. I take that back. Anyway, he and I'm to my amazement, he starts talking about the materials and analyzing them. And I said, "Are you telling me that you were there?" He said, "No, no, I was at Wright with Art X, and Art's going to want you to call him, and here's his number." And so I wrote a whole book based on what they called. They told me called Majestic. Speaking of fiction, they they had no documentation, but they were, 
you know, two mature, sincere men, a, a colonel and a general in the United States Air Force, and I don't think that they were lying. And um, so I wrote this novel called Majestic, which sort of e- explores the whole thing that, that, that happened at Roswell. It was fascinating. But the visitors are, they're not easy. And the book A New World is based on something that a, an intelligence officer who wrote his own book about this subject uh, uh, said that he had had, and his book is, I'm not sure it's all true or, you know, the memories in it are kind of screwy. I mean, he himself was was very plain spoken about it. He said it was just all so strange. I did my my best. Um, and um, at one point, he was in a situation where he was able to ask them, one of them, a question. And he asked, what is in it for us? And the answer was, a new world, if you can take it. And that means they, they're, they're going to re- always compress everything. If you can take it means if you can... You can bear it, you can handle it, if you can get it out of our hands, if you can hold on to it. And the book is basically, my book, A New World, is about those very things. It's about the experience of living intimately with them in a way that was productive and useful to me. As to far as whether it was useful to them, I don't know. But they came back, and they still do. So it must have some value to them as well. And it's hopefully the beginning of some kind of real contact, because we could we could use some help here. I mean, yeah, we really could. And, you know, they're, they're there. They're here, whoever they are. So I've got this half-quacked-up question. Bad pun, because I'm Jim Howard, because anyways... What what made you what prompted you to write the book now? Because this experience has been going on for a while now. Oh no, they there was they they've got a timeline, man, and this was on their timeline. I did not plan. They they I got this. They started the book, and they're you know they don't have like holidays and evenings apparently. <laughs> <laughs> it was. I wrote that book very fast because they wanted it out. They wanted it out. Now, what we're talking about here today is not the original book. The original book was out last summer uh, or last November. This is the the broader publication of it through Beyond Word, through the through, through a conventional publishing house. In order to get it out on their timeline, I had to put the initial edition, the Kindle edition, out myself. And um, they are they are on some kind of a timeline, it seems to me. And they think, I think that they think that we're in a lot of trouble uh, here, and I think that they want us to survive. I think they, they started declaring their presence here in 1947 because we started using atomic weapons. And ever since then, they have been extremely interested in our atomic facilities of all kinds, and then ultimately also interested in us. And I have wondered if the abductions which took place starting in the in in large numbers starting in the sixties and going through the eighties and into the early nineties were not an attempt to make a a record of us, a DNA record and sex, using that in sexual materials in case we fail completely as a species. Um, I don't know. Because one thing they're not going to do is they're not going to get in the way of our fate. Uh, You know, it's your world. You have to live it, basically. And they're very aware of, at least they have been in my life, of cultural colonization. That is to say, when someone of much greater technological prowess comes into the lives of someone with less, 
the person, the individuals with less, totally focus on on the ones with with more, and they they lose all of their own individuality and integrity. And you see that all over the world, all, wherever the European empires went, with their beautiful silverware and cutlery and knives and guns and all that stuff, the local people just forgot about their own world and, and became totally dependent. And they don't want that to happen. So at the same time, they don't want us to to go under. So they're kind of walking a tightrope. They're going to do as much as they can to help us. Well, I, but, I, I hope so. I mean, because we're doing yeah, we're, do, we're doing all we they, can to screw each other up. So I hope somebody out there is going to. Yeah, try to well, help I know us. it, but they are not going to. They are not. If we decide to go, if we do, if we do not help ourselves, they will not help us. But the more we help ourselves, the more they will help us. Uh, but we have to do it. And we, we, you know, right now we're doing everything we can to pretend this planet isn't falling apart around our ears, but it is. It yeah. is. It's, in, it's crazy. Um, All the fires, the storms, and, you know, we don't even read about the massive fires that were in Siberia uh, this summer because it's so far away. We just read about the ones on the coast of California, but in fact, are in the Amazon burning down and I wrote a book years ago called Nature's End before I ever met the visitors, and it predicts, it's eerily predictive of what is happening now. It's very strange. You know, you wonder, and of course in 1985 when I tried to, to do press for the book, the environmental reporters just laughed in my face and said it would never be this bad and you know that there wouldn't be any fires in the amazon in 2020 or anything like that and unfortunately the book was accurate it's a work of fiction i wrote it with a friend jim kanetkin he is a science writer and you know sort of was fiction in fact mixed together it's it's scary where we're at today i mean compared to where we were and where, where we could be headed it just blows my mind at times well, it's going to get very intense very quickly. The next few years are going to be each one. There will there will be a time when we look back to 2020 with nostalgia and think to ourselves, oh, things were so much easier then. I don't want to think about that. Hey, we're almost... No, me neither. We've got about two minutes left. I just looked at the clock, and I'll, you know how that goes when you're doing these kind of shows. Ah! Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so... People can get a, a New World uh, by Whitley Strieber anywhere fine books are sold, uh, even Audible and all these other great things. Yeah, and, and, and even and, not so fine books, that, that'll probably work too. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have a bunch of them out there too. Well, I don't have too much in print right now. A New World is in print, and Afterlife Revolution is in print, and uh, Superstorm, and uh, not Superstorm, um, Supernatural is in print, and a book called The Key. I think those are the ones that are actually available in the stores. You know, and you can order. But uh, they're there. They're well, definitely there. And A New World is... A New World is... Uh, it was a marvelous experience to write. Working directly with them. <laughs> That's <laughs> fabulous. I'm a lucky man, I have to tell you. Uh, you sure are. Hey, I appreciate the time that we got to track you down again, and there's a whole bunch of other things that I just... Obviously, didn't even get into because we just so many things with you because you've you've you have been a lucky man. <laughs> thank you so much for having me on, and thank you for coming. Uh, have a good evening. Yep. And that and that's the legendary Whitley Strieber, um, and the legend George Ooh. Norrie, and I'm just absolutely blown away to pull that stunt off and have them together. And uh, yeah. <laughs> The annual prediction show next week. Man, what a great ride we've been on. From Rand Goldman last week talking about COVID and children's uh, virtual reality to George and Whitley to predictions. This is just the great time of year for me. Um, great time for the show. So I just want to say I appreciate you all for being here. I've seen some great faces in here tonight. And, um, man, be ready for next week. That's all I can say. <laughs>